great to be here. It's an honor and a privilege to uh, be able to bring a message today. I talked to Pastor Gary Clark. He had called and I talked to him for quite a few minutes. And I understand that he doesn't open up um, his stage just to anybody to share. So it's a blessing and an honor. And the message that he asked me to bring, the title of it was Beating Addiction. So I want to pray real quick before we get into it. Lord, Heavenly Father, we, I thank you again for this opportunity to bring your word, Father. I pray, Lord, that you let your word go forth. We know it doesn't return void. And touch every one of our hearts, Lord. Change us on the inside, Lord. Help us to walk out of here to not be the same as the way we came in, Lord. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So with beating addiction, I'm going to get into a couple different points. I have five different steps to beating addiction to what I have found that has worked to beat addiction. Um, the, I want to open with Galatians 5.1. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So Paul was talking to the Galatians and he told them they had came out of bondage, Christ had set them free, and he was explaining to them not to get stuck back in the bondage that they once were in. So today when we talk about beating addiction, we're going to be talking about many different addictions. Because see, when we think of beating addiction or bondage, as he said, do not be, set, do not be put back in the bondage you once were. When we talk about bondage, bondage can be many different things. It could be drug addiction. We tend to think of drug addiction right away when we hear addiction or alcoholism. But it can be many things. It can be TV. It can be pornography. It can be gambling. It can be smoking, prescription medication. There's many different bondages. So I honestly believe that this word today is for every single one of us. Please don't discount the message because it says beating addiction and you feel you don't have an addiction. Because we all still live in the flesh and we all still have a flesh nature. So we're all always overcoming the flesh daily. So there's always addictions and bondages that's going to be in our lives. So step one to beating addiction is we must expose it. We cannot keep it silent. We must be willing to be prepared to address the issue and bring it out in the open. Because, see, the devil would love, more, would love nothing more than for you to be struggling with addiction or struggling with a bondage in your life, some kind of habit that you can't break, and you to be quiet about it. Because if you be quiet about it, then you're not really doing much. I used to come in here and I would sit in the back probably three rows down and I'd walk back out every Sunday. The power of Jesus Christ was here to set me free, yet I wasn't taking a hold of it and I was keeping silent. I wasn't coming forward and telling Pastor Gary that I was struggling with addiction. So we must bring it open. Galatians 5, 14 through 16 says, are any of you sick? The world wants to call addiction, in A and AA, I went through in A and AA, tried that. The world wants to call an addiction a disease that is incurable, a sickness. So are any of you sick? Are any of you struggling? Are any of you uh, having addictions? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you. Does it say to be quiet and not tell any of the elders? Anybody? No, he said call for the elders. So therefore, make your need known. Let somebody know about it. That they may come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And if you committed any sins, you'll be forgiven. So we're called to... Let the, let the addiction be known. If you're going to beat addiction, the first step is to let people know. You have to expose it. Galatians 16, 5, 16 says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Does it say keep your sins to yourself and just confess it to the Lord in the closet by yourself and try to overcome it yourself? No, it says confess it to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Then we go forward a couple verses later. In verse 19 and 20, and it says, My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save the person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. See, the temptation is when you have a struggling uh, loved one, a child, a grandchild, the, the temptation is not to tell anybody. First off, because it's going to embarrass you if the church knows that your own kid is doing bad, especially when you have preachers or pastors that kids are struggling with addiction and stuck in sin, they don't want to tell people because, see, honestly, the church is just as critical as the world in many cases. They're going to criticize that pastor. What are you not doing right? But see, it says if any of you brings that sinner back from wandering, if anyone wanders from the truth, gets strung out, struggling with addiction, but someone brings them back, they save them from death. Not only a, a physical death because we know drunk driving leads to death, Drug overdoses, are, it's an epidemic right now and people are dying. But it's also a spiritual death. You bring them back and you bring them to the Lord and you can save their souls and help God save their souls and rescue them to bring about forgiveness of many sins. So, 
in Revelation it says, they overcame them by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So I want to share a little bit of my testimony. There again is another example in Scripture where we have to openly share. Share what we're going through. And me as a child, I got into drugs about the age of 12. Um, I started struggling with drugs at a young, young age. I started experimenting with many, many, many different drugs. And by the time I was 16, I was already selling drugs to help uh, supply my habit. By the time I was 18 to 20, I ran into this blue pill called an Oxycontin. It's a prescription painkiller. At that time, it was only for chronic back pain or cancer patients. And it took over my life. I was nodding out all the time. I was a wild heathen. It had taken complete control of my life. I would be driving to work, running into medians on the side of the road. I'd wake up on the other side of the interstate facing oncoming cars. I would wake up in the morning and I would, I, my car would be totaled. I don't know how I made it home. It had taken over my life. I began trying to get help because I started getting in jails over and over and over. And so I started seeking help through NA and AA, as I said. And I would get clean for a couple months. But every time I'd get out of the halfway house or I'd get out of that jail treatment program, I'd always end up going back to the drugs. So I finally ran to Florida because my grandma, the Christian, and my family had moved from Indianapolis down here to Florida in Inglewood. In Inglewood. And she began attending this church, so I began coming to church with her. I had gotten saved in 2007 in a jail cell, so I'd been set free from the drugs. But I got tangled back in the drugs. And I came, and I would sit three rows down with my grandma almost every Sunday, crying out for the Lord to set me free from addiction because he had done it before. And then one day, God was faithful and brought Loving Hands Ministries and Pastor Wendell Wilson on this stage as they were today. And I had hope. It wasn't right away. I was struggling. And it took me hitting more rock bottoms to get to the point. But I finally submitted. And there, James 4, 7 says, Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I hear a lot of Christians that say, resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Resist the devil. But see, verse 1. What does verse 1 say? Therefore, submit to God. Then resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Amen. We can't resist the devil on our own. We have to be submitted to God. See, it's only resisting the devil through the power of Jesus Christ that we're able to do anything. Amen. That's right. So I submitted to God. I went to Loving Hands Ministries. But, but step two, sorry, step two is we have to submit to God. And see, submitting to God is surrendering your life to Christ. If you submit to the authorities, you put your hands behind your back, you let them put you in cuffs, they take full control over you. It's no longer you are set free. You must submit to God and surrender your life to Christ. So I went back to Loving Hands Ministries. So I went to Loving Hands Ministries for the first time. God began discipling me. Had a great man of God, this man of faith, begin raising me up and discipling me. It, it's a very, very, very strict program, and I ended up leaving. I left because, see, I knew what was right, but I wanted to serve God on my own terms. I wanted to do my own thing, and you can see in my Facebook post in 2009. Just got home from Loving Hands Ministries after six months. It's an 18 to 24 month program. Just got home from Loving Hands Ministries after six months. Feels so good to be free. Uh, the next day is home from Loving Hands Ministries and loving it. I was loving it. I was, I was trying to serve God on my terms. Do what I wanted to do. But see, the, the drugs took over my life because see, I, I wasn't submitted to God. I would went back out and I wanted to do right for Jesus. I was still coming to church. And as you see in this picture, there's a fellowship sticker on the car. I had a fellowship sticker on my car. I had a Chevy Cobalt. But I'd got tangled up back in the drugs. I wasn't submitted to God. And the sin had entangled me. So I had that fellowship sticker on my car, and I was going around to all these bars here in Inglewood. I was going and hanging out at the strip club in Port Charlotte with that sticker on my car. I'd been kicked out of most bars here in Inglewood because I was such a blackout drinker, yet having a fellowship sticker on my car, a magnet on my car. I even came to church one weekend and I came out and my car had been spray painted on. No other car in the whole parking lot here, right out front. No other car had been spray painted on, but mine had. And I had that fellowship sticker. And the only thing I can think is that that bar I'd been kicked out of down the street, someone recognized my car and came and got some revenge. And then another time I was sitting here in church and Pastor Gary got up here and started talking about, don't go put our magnet on your car if you're going to go hang out at the bars. I thought for sure he had to have seen my car outside of some bars or something. I'm dead serious. And my grandma just looked at me like, he's talking about you. Then I, I began getting back into the pills. So bad to the point that I came in here one, one Sunday morning and I sat down 
And I went into the bathroom and snorted a pill during worship and came back in here and began worshiping the Lord and serving, serving God, I thought, trying to, trying to serve God and do what was right. But see, in Genesis 4, it talks about Cain and Abel. And Cain and Abel, they both were going to worship the Lord. They both had sacrifices, they, they offerings that they were given to God. But see, one had an offering that God wanted, and another was trying to give God an offering that he wanted to give, not what he was calling. This is what I was doing in my own sense. I was trying to serve God in my power the way I wanted without being submitted to him. So in Genesis 4, 3, it says, When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of his firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel in his gift, but he did not accept Cain in his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. God said, Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You'll be accepted if you do what's right. If you do what I tell you, you'll be accepted. If you give the offering I commanded, you'll be accepted. But if you refuse to do what is right, if you refuse to do what is good, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door and eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. See, I was trying to serve God. I still would tell people about Jesus when I'd get wasted out there. I'd tell the pill dealer here in Inglewood about Jesus. I'd be sticking tracks in the windshield of the guy that came and dropped me pills. I, I was driving around with a Jesus painted on the hood of my truck uh, to the drug dealer's house, and they would mock it. Who is that, the zigzag man? Uh, you know, I was trying to serve God in my own power, but it says if you do what is right, you will be accepted. So what is right? What is good? Because he says if you do good, if you do what's right, you'll be accepted. Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul says, I beseech you therefore. Now this verse right here, these two verses, I think if every Christian could get these two verses down in their spirit and dwell on it long enough, meditate it long enough that it sinks down into their spirit and they follow these two scriptures, I believe we would have some powerful Christians in the United States and Christ would be raised back up. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, I beseech you, present your body a living sacrifice that holy and acceptable to God which is your reasonable service. In the Greek, that means your reasonable act of worship. Present your body a living sacrifice. That's your reasonable act of worship. Worship is not coming to church on Sunday and Wednesday night and raising hands through three or four songs, singing songs. Your reasonable act of worship is presenting your body a living sacrifice. Yeah, amen. What does it mean, a living sacrifice? See, Jesus Christ, back in the Old Testament, symbolizing Jesus Christ, there were lambs that were slaughtered. There were lots of animals, bulls, rams, goats that were slaughtered. They were killed as a dead sacrifice to the Lord. They had to have bloodshed. Jesus Christ came in the New Testament and was the last sacrifice that had to be killed. His blood being shed atoned for all other sacrifices that were just covering up a little bit. And Jesus Christ shed His blood and that was the last dead sacrifice. And because Jesus Christ shed His blood, we are called now to be living sacrifices Amen. because Christ's Spirit lives in us. We are called to live our lives Set apart for God. Surrendered to Christ. Amen. Everything we do, we should be looking to God and asking God what He would have us to do. That's, right. That's our calling. Present our bodies a living sacrifice. Does it say present our bodies a living sacrifice, dirty, looking like the world? No, it says holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of service or worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that Good. There's the word good. What is good? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He said if you do good, you'll be accepted. God comes and says in Romans in the New Testament, the good and acceptable perfect will of God is to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and set apart. If you don't fully surrender your life to God as a living sacrifice, sin is waiting at the door and will take you over. Church, listen. Listen. If you don't present your body a living sacrifice to God, Sin is waiting at the door, and its desire is to have you. But God appointed you so that you may control that, so that that sin won't entangle you. We cannot be a powerful body of Christ in this dark world that's pulling us down and down and down if we don't stand up and live our lives as Christ. People do not want to see someone that goes to church on Sunday or Wednesday, but is still going to the bars, or still cursing, or still watching the same dirty movies, or doing all the same things they do because, see, they can do that without going to church on Sunday morning. 
It's too easy for us to, see, to please our conscience to come on Sunday and throw some money in the offering and go out. But that's not what we're called to do. We're called to live our lives as a living sacrifice. So on Ju July 24, 2010, it began ringing in. I'd flipped a truck into a co company truck into a cornfield two weeks after working for the company in Kentucky, being super drunk. And I said, God, if you'll let me go back to loving hands, if you'll keep me from being arrested, I'll go back to loving hands. And he did. July 24, 2010, catching a plane at 10.15 a.m. in Indianapolis and heading to Florida. I'm going back to Loving Hands Ministries where I belong. Thank you, Jesus. These aren't made up. He found these on my timeline. I didn't tell him to put these in the PowerPoint. He went and found these. So I began seeing it. John 15, 16 says, you didn't choose me. We didn't choose God. But God chose us and he pointed us to bear fruit, lasting fruit. I chose you and appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. See, it's too easy to think that we accepted Christ. We, 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 we turned to Christ. But see, we didn't choose God. God chose us before the foundation of the world. We are His. And in this picture, you see a tree. You see fruit. You see leaves on the tree. Trees bear fruit. That's what they're made for. Now, if you lop off this branch right here, what's going to happen to this, this branch? If you come back in two weeks, are there going to be leaves still growing? Is there going to be apples still growing on that tree, that branch? No, the branch is going to die because, see, this branch's life is in the tree. This branch cannot grow fruit on its own. Does everybody agree with that? Yeah. I, mean, everybody, I mean, that's pretty, pretty logical. This tree cannot do nothing except for apart from the, from the, from the actual, the branch can't do anything apart from the tree. And I'm going to read uh, 16 verses, John 15, 1 through 16. I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And He prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. See, these men at Loving Hands Ministries are being pruned. That's why I wanted to leave so bad and I left multiple times. Because I was getting pruned and I didn't like it. My flesh was dying and getting killed purposely. And I didn't like it. See, we prune these men. These men are getting pruned by God through Loving Hands Ministries so that they bear even more fruit. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I've given you. Your salvation pruned you and, and clean, cleansed you up immediately. Remain in me and I will remain in you. We have to remain in God or God doesn't remain in us. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. See, we can't do God's work without Him. We can't do work if we're not surrendered to Christ. We can do activities and and just look like we're doing church, but we can't do anything or bear fruit if we don't have God, if we're not inside God. Yes, I am the vine, says Jesus. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is strictly saying this right to us. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is a thrown away like a useless branch, and it withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. Everybody here knows where the non-believers will go after this life. If you perish and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and made Him Lord of your life, you will be in hell. I think all of us agree with that. And this is a, another uh, saying of it. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. Are you producing fruit? Is your life as a Christian producing fruit? Or is it just an activity or a... Or a, or a accessory that you wear on the side. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to the Father. Our job is to glorify the Father. I've loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in His love. See, we're called to obey Christ. We're called to obey the Bible. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I've loved you. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. There again, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for my name. We're called to serve Christ with our entire lives, to bear fruit with everything that is in us. That is our calling. And when we don't bear fruit, 
there's a good chance maybe we're not in Christ. Step three of beating addiction, to continually beat addiction, any of your habits, any of the sin that lingers around in your flesh, is to abide in Christ. You must abide in Christ. Because if we're not in Christ, His Word says that we can't do anything. We must keep His commands, His Word. The Bible is God's commands to us, is Jesus' commands to us. I've heard people say, we don't go by Jesus' teachings. We go by the apostles' teachings. Jesus' teachings were just for the apostles. And if we love Jesus and our lives are about Jesus and Jesus is the one for died, we died, that died for us, why wouldn't we follow Jesus' teachings? Especially since He cared about us so much to die for us. You think He just said those words in vain? It, it doesn't make it even sense to me. James 1, 14-15 says, Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when a sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. And see, I'm going to have Gus come share with you real quick a little bit of his testimony. And see, I tried serving God in my own time. I tried serving God the way I wanted to, and it started bringing forth death. That sin became bearing fruit, and I was wrecking my car. I flipped that truck into a cornfield. It was on the verge of bringing forth death. So, Gus, I want you to share real quick. I want to testify that I, I myself was lost. I lived a life, a wretched man. I want to testify that I was blind, but now I can see. I want to testify that I was lost, but now I am found. I want to testify that I was seeking for love, and I finally found a love so pure. An agape love, an unconditional love, a love that does not fade, a love that cannot be manufactured by man, a love that has permeated the inner depths of my soul. This love in Jesus Christ. I have found this love. And in the Son of God, he who believes, out of his heart will flow liver, rivers of living water. And I have found living water. Praise to God. Praise to God. I was addicted to cocaine, sex. Money, drugs, and all those things are worthless. Worthless. I grew up in, in, in Miami, a impoverished neighborhood, adapted to a life of crime. My father was an addict all my life. He struggled with alcoholism. Really affected. I hated seeing my mom scream through his violence. I saw my mom, when my mom would be choked to the point of unconsciousness, I used to run as far as I could from my house and just cover my ears because I hated hearing my mom scream. I hated being home, so I ran to these streets where I felt embraced. I felt this, this fake love. My best friend got saved. His name was David. I loved him dearly. i known him since I was a little boy. We did everything together. And he was touched by God. He was touched by God in such a way that he had a glow to him. The Spirit of God was upon him. He had an anointing, a change in his heart. And I wanted that. That what I was seeking. I didn't have it, and I wanted it, and I saw it in him, in his everyday life. And December 2nd, I remember I spoke to him on December 1st. I was incarcerated, awaiting bond. And I spoke to him over the phone, and he told me how much he loved me. He read me Proverbs, and he prayed with me. December 2nd, I was bonded out to get to my house to realize that he was murdered, shot and killed for $20 that he had in his pocket. Innocent bystander, I buried my best friend at 20 years old, and I saw his lifeless body. He was shot one time, bounced off his lung and pierced his heart. One time, killed him. And I saw his lifeless body before me. And I remember I was, I was in such deep anguish and hatred just stirred in me. In such a way that I wanted nothing to do with God. Nothing. And I walked away from this casket. And I didn't even want to hear about Jesus. I just saw him and I was in tears. And I couldn't even say goodbye. That was it. Selfishly. But now he's in a glorious place in streets of gold. In the presence of our Savior. And now I praise him for that. But all these trials and, and this journey that I was on. Still on this mission, trying to pinpoint what it is that I'm missing. I couldn't pinpoint it. And I cried out to Pastor Wendell. 25 months ago, I came into loving hands. I was so broken, I have reached my bottom, my complete bottom. 
I, I was going to be a part of a robbery where we were going to tie up these two men for 25 kilos of cocaine, half a million dollars worth of street drugs. I was going to be the getaway driver. I just want to inform you that my friends were going to execute these people in the house. Tie these people up once we found the cocaine and execute them. But God had a greater plan. He had his finger on my life. I had a praying mother, a praying family. I had gave my life to Christ as a young boy. And his blood was protecting me, and I didn't even know it. The night before the robbery, I took the getaway vehicle, and I overslept in the hotel because I was drinking without my cell phone, without access to my phone. I overslept. My friends went without me to do the robbery that morning at 9 in the morning. Turns out those men that were undercovers were drug dealers, were undercover federal agents working with the ATF. Turns out they opened fire and killed my friend driving that car. That's the vehicle they were in, the Kia, that we were going to burn up with the bodies. He was in there, driving, Sergio. He died with his phone in his hand, calling my cell phone, the phone record show. They arrested me in my hotel because I had a GPS on the rental, and I was facing conspiracy to murder charges. In federal custody, when they showed me the mugshot and tell me that my friend was murdered, I was released to a funeral service where I saw his two children crying over this casket that we held. Two teenage children. Now they're, they're orphans. They have no parents. And that's when, when I got to the point of my bottom. There had to be a greater purpose. There had to be more to life than the life that I was living. There had to be. I couldn't figure it out. But I remember I cried out to pastor, I called him, and I needed help. And as, as Joe was preaching, I see the glory of God making disciples, manufacturing men of God, making them. And he, he, he was speaking on Genesis, and I was thinking and pondering about the, the, the creation of man and how the Almighty, the Creator, came and out of the dirt, picked up dirt and made creation, and out of his holy breath, breathed into to to his holy breath nos in our nostrils, breathe the breath of life. And he breathed that life for a greater purpose than addiction. He breathed that power in us, that holy power to be victors, ambassador, kings, disciples, making disciples. When he breathed that life and created a being, he created it so we could be in his image to infect this world for the sake of the gospel, that wherever we may be, we stand as a light, not ashamed of this gospel that is saving the souls of men. And I encourage, live for Christ and to die is gain. Hallelujah. And I can stand before God and the church and leave you with this. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Sin, when sin begins to bring forth and we don't abide in God's word, we don't abide in Christ, it brings forth death. You heard about the death, the death all around Gustavo's life. There was death all, death all around mine. That sin brings forth death. And if we're not abiding in Christ, sin is crouching at the door. But see, now you see the good side. You see where God has brought him from now. Why do you think it is he's so on fire for God? See, he got, he got pulled out of that mess, pulled out of that muck, and set in Loving Hands Ministries where these men are separated from the world and they're, they're able to be drenched in the Word, basically drowned in the Word of God. And it begins causing transformation. Ephesians 5, 25 and 27. 25 through 27. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Christ gave up His life for the church, for the body of Christ, to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's Word. Gus is being cleansed by God's Word. But why, why again did Christ give, give up His life? Did, did He give it up so that we'd go to church? So that we would just have stickers on? So that um, we would give in the offering plate? No, He gave his life for the church to make her holy and clean. Spotless. 
not like the world, not come to church, but then go back to your job on Monday and cursing like everybody else, watching the same inappropriate things everybody else is watching, listening to the same things as everybody else, going out to the bars. No, he came to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's Word. He did this to present her to himself. Christ died to present the church, us, to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. That's the reason Christ came for us, to make us clean. But He uses God's Word to cleanse us. Step four, we must abide in God's Word. See, God took a radical, I was a heroin junkie, terrible person, crazy Joe, took me and transformed me, but took Gustavo even. He was a drug dealer in Miami took him and transformed him. You saw, that's why I wanted him to share. You saw the power of God in his life. God is radiating through him. That man is going to go out and do great things. God's spirit flows through him when he speaks. And you want God to empower you like that in those rivers of living waters to flow out of you? You have to abide in his word. Step four, if you want to beat any addiction, any habit, anything you struggle with, you must abide in God's word. What is abiding in His Word? It's reading and studying the Bible, but then obeying it. You must obey it. Many people read and study it, but then they're not applying it. They're not, they're not obeying what it says. They pick and choose what they want to do. Oh, well, that was a different generation. Those people were different. They didn't have like social media and Facebook. and uh, They didn't have phones in their hands at all times. They didn't really mean that stuff. There wasn't even TVs around back then. Joshua 1 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. It shall not depart from your mouth. Meditate in it day and night, so that you can observe to do according to all that is written in it. How are you going to obey the Word of God? You must read it and study it. There's no option. You must read it and study it. Psalm 119.11, David says, The word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. How do we not sin against God? We must hide the word in our hearts and study it all the time. We must abide in his word and we must obey it. Um, I heard another preacher tell a story about, um, he told, say, his kid, he made this uh, example. He tells his kid to go clean his room. Say you tell someone to go clean the room. So the kid goes and goes up in his room comes back an hour or two later. He's like, hey, Dad, I studied the word clean. I got out my strongs and I looked up the word clean and, and I figured out what it meant. Figured out everything it meant, even what they really originally meant with it. I got my friends over. We started studying the word clean. We like told each other what we were thinking about the different things. And he says, did you clean the room? Oh, no. No, but we had a two-hour meeting and study on the word clean. We know exactly what it means but yet they never applied it to their lives. The Word of God is not made as a, no, a book of knowledge to just learn information and have it stored in your head so you can quote some verses and sound cool around people. The Word of God is made to, living, to live it. It's an instruction manual so we cannot live in, in sin, so that we cannot live struggling day in and day out, so we don't go around b bitter, murmuring, and gossiping all the time. It's not so that we can struggle. God's Word gave it to us as an instruction manual. He knew what was best for us. He made us. We are to obey it. There's, through Loving Hands Ministries, <clears throat> and a, different, a couple different uh, ministries, you know, we learn techniques of uh, going out and witnessing. You know, different ways to witness. And there's many different uh, avenues. And one of them I hear, you know, is people go out and they say, hey, they go up to random people, hey, do you know Jesus loves you? And that's great. But the question that they need to ask themselves is, do I love Jesus? Not necessarily, do, do, do you know that Jesus loves you? But do I love Jesus? Because you can go out there and not even be living the Word and ask people if they know that Jesus loves them. But do you love Jesus? Fellowship Church, we love Jesus and we love people, right? Do you guys love Jesus? What is one of the requirements? What is the real question? Do we love Jesus? What does Jesus say? If you love me, what? John 14, 15, he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Because there's a lot of people that love Jesus, but they're not keeping his commandments. 
They're not following the Word of God. They're not staying away from sin, abhorring it like God does. See, God hates sin. People say God doesn't hate. Well, they're wrong. God hates sin. Hates it. Abhors even the presence of sin. Jesus hates. Did anybody know Jesus hates? If you read the Bible, you know Jesus hates. Jesus hates sin. The sin He gave His life and shed His blood for on that cross. He hated it so much, He walked into the temple, our present day church, and started flipping tables. Flipping the tables. Jesus hates sin. We have to get to a point where we hate the sin we once loved. And if we hate the sin we once loved, then we'll keep His commandments because it's God's Word is the only thing that can keep us from sinning against God. Faith and obedience are inseparable. Faith in Jesus Christ, saving faith is, and obedience are inseparable. Obedience is the evidence of true faith. You obeying the Word of God and what's written in the Word of God is evidence that you truly confess Jesus Christ as your Lord of your life and your Savior. We must obey His Word. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Check yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you're disqualified. Unless indeed Jesus Christ really isn't in you. Test yourselves. We must test our faith and see if we're truly in faith. Do we really live as Jesus Christ being our Lord? Do our actions show it? Do our lifestyles? These men at Loving Hands are trained to do a DMI every single night. It's called a daily moral inventory. It has checks and balances on both sides. Um, did you forget God today? Did you lie? Were you honest? Were you remembering God? Um, blah, blah, blah. All, all down each side. They're trained to examine themselves daily. And we as Christians are even encouraged by Paul to observe ourselves, test our faith, examine ourselves. See if we're really in the faith. Are we living out the faith that we're proclaiming that we believe? Step five, we must have genuine faith. We must examine our faith. We have to. It's not an option. We must examine and see, are we truly in the faith that we so much claim? Matthew 7.21 it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior at one time, sometime throughout their life, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. This is Jesus speaking. Back in the old days, when it, when it used a word, like uh, repeated, if it repeated a word right in a row, Lord, Lord, that meant it was a lot of emphasis. Like very, 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 very emphasized. These people confessed Christ as their Lord. Lord, Lord. But Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But who? Those who attend church without missing only one day a week? Those who only miss one, one Sunday out of the year? Those who pay their regular tithes and their offerings? Those who serve in the church? Those who go knock door to door? No, only he who does the will of the Father. Only he who does the will of the Father. And we, heard, we read in Romans 12, 1 and 2 what the will of the Father is so that we may prove what is that pleasing, acceptable will of the Father. To present our lives a living sacrifice for God. That's what we're called to do. That's what God has called us to do. Live our lives. And if we live our lives completely surrendered to Him, let Him use us wherever He wants, then we know His will will be done in our lives. And we know for a fact we're saved because we'll be able to look back and test and examine ourselves and see where God is bringing us, where He's brought us from. I took a lot of reports. I, I read a lot of things that are shocking about Americans, uh, American Christians and America, uh, Americans that go to church. And so I put some reports up here from Barna Reports. In 2013, 47% of Americans had not attended a church in the past six months. That's not that shocking because we know that most of America does not necessarily believe in Christ. But only 26% of Americans that have been to the church say their lives have been changed or affected greatly by attending church. Only 25%, only one out of four people that go to church say their lives have even been changed by going to church. When Jesus Christ came and died for us, He died to change us. He died so that we could come as we are, yes. But He died and loves us so much not to leave us the same. Our lives are called to be transformed. 
If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old life is gone, a new life has come. So if your life isn't transformed from before you accepted Christ, there's something going on there. Adults that define themselves as Christians but are not born again constitutes half of the population that embraces the Christian label. Half of the people that confess themselves as Christians are not born again. Jesus Christ said you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. There's no option. There's no, He is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no second road. There is no other way. If you're not born again, you're not saved. If you're not born again, you're not going to go to heaven if you die today. Ye must be born again. Four out of five adults embrace the Christian label. Yet only one out of five claim that accepting Jesus Christ as Savior was the single most important decision made in their lives. Only one out of five people that confess to be Christians say that accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior was the most important decision they ever made. Is it the most important decision you've ever made? I know, I know, I know I'd be nothing without Christ. There's no option. Without Christ, I'm dead in my sins. And we're all dead in our trespasses until Christ comes and makes us alive. That should be the most important decision we ever make in our lives. Because without Christ, we are nothing. Only one out of six Christians say that they are totally committed to engaging in personal spiritual development. And this is one of the areas I think churches are missing it. The whole discipleship process. We are not called to make converts and walk away from them and leave them for the wolves to eat them up. We are called to go and make disciples. We are called to raise these men up and, and when, they're, when they're taught not to, not, that they don't need to change or they don't need any kind of training or uh, any kind of growth, th- then they're dying. What happens if you don't eat? Eventually you die. You begin to wither away and you die. And if you're not getting any spiritual food, you're dying spiritually. If you're not growing closer to God, you're falling farther away. We as a church must begin to raise our people up. We have to hold them accountable. We have to show them what the Word of God really says to make a generation that's going to go out and change the world. And I believe that there are some young churches that are rising up that are making disciples that are going to go out and change the world. These and others have been here that have turned the world upside down and said in Acts. There's four common barriers, Barna reports, to transformation. One, lack of commitment. We don't want to commit. We do not want to die to ourselves daily We don't want to forsake all. We don't want to have to hate mother and brother and father and sister more than in our own lives more than Jesus. We just don't want to commit. We want to do things my way like I did when I left the ministry. I wanted to serve God in my terms. We cannot serve God in our terms. That's not what He's called us to. Two, the unwillingness to fully repent. One of the most common barriers to transformation. Because in this world, society has gotten so crazy that we just call it uh, a mistake. If you got someone pregnant, uh, they made a mistake. That's a, they just made a mistake. They committed adultery on their wife or their husband. Uh, they, they just made a mistake. They, they, they got caught up in the moment and they made a mistake. It's not a mistake, it's sin. And it's sin in the heart that's making this addiction go rampant. We have to cut the sin off. And we have to take responsibility for what's really going on. Repenting is not getting sorry. And coming to an altar and crying because you're sorry for whatever it is, whether it's just because you got caught or you feel bad. We have to own up to the sin. That is what is causing us to not grow because it's all just mistakes and none of us are perfect. Jesus was the only perfect one. He said, be ye holy as I am holy is what the Word of God says. His grace is sufficient for us to live holy, pleasing lives set apart to Him. Confusing activity for growth. The other common barrier for transformation. Or third, I'm sorry. Confusing activity for growth. Coming into church on Wednesday and Sunday, doing the routine, throwing money in the plate, going out and serving. Confusing the activity, the things we're doing for the Lord, for actual, our relationship growing with the Lord. And failure to engage in a genuine accountable community. We all must be accountable. Jesus Christ was accountable to the Father. He said, I only say what the Father tells me to say. I only do what the Father tells me to do. He even said, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, your will. Jesus Christ was accountable, and we all had to find someone to be accountable for. 
Or you can do like I did, and you can walk in this church, sit in the back, and walk back out right as the service is over and not talk to anybody, and still live in the same sin, the same addiction, the same bondage, the same habit that you've been in this whole time. But God died and shed His blood so that we would be set free. We are victors. We are victors that we're supposed to live in victory. We're not supposed to struggle and walk around miserable. What non-believer wants to be a Christian if all they do is walk around and they look miserable all the time? We're called to be free. They do that stuff in uh, AA. I, I remember sitting in an AA meeting seeing this man that had been 50-something years old. He'd been sober 30 years and he was miserable. We called him dry drunks. He was miserable. I said, I don't want to be in this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to be 50 years old and still be as miserable as I was when I was drinking. God came for a purpose. To set us free. To make us new creations. Creations in Christ. That can live for Him. And bring joy to the hurting world. That world is hurting. They need Jesus. I'm telling you. They need Jesus. And many of them want to hear about it. If you show them the love of Christ, it breaks through. The love of Christ is powerful. And it breaks through. And it breaks through that hardness and wall they've set up. And they will open into it. They will be open to it. I've been blessed to go on this mission trip uh, a week from Tuesday to this collection of 10,000 of these, they call juggalos. There are these people that listen and almost worship this music that ABC News says it sounds like uh, nursery rhymes laced with murder. These guys will be having, uh, doing drugs all four days. It's a big four-day party festival. Yet God has opened the door for me to go in there with the love of Christ the truth of His Word, and allowed me right in there. So much that the owner of Psychopathic Records, one of the three, the big brother of the main guy, Violent J, called our ministry up and asked for me personally. 20 minutes I was on the phone with him. What are you trying to do? What is this you're trying to do? Yet, we went into intercession when he said, well, let me call you back, and he tried shutting me down for 15 minutes. 15 minutes. This guy's cussing on the phone and saying, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. The Word of God is powerful and the Spirit of God is living. And he called me back. We went into intercessory prayer when he hung up the phone. said, let me just check. I, I just don't see how we can make this work. I, I appreciate what you do, but we can't make this work. I don't think it's going to work. We went into intercessory prayer. Right after we got done, ten minutes after, I, probably only five minutes after he hung up, he called back. And he said, okay, okay, you can come. I can come to a secular event and tell people about Jesus Christ. Show the love of Christ to them. The church isn't reaching the juggalos. The church don't want anything to do with them. They're misfits. They dress in all black and paint their faces. Listen, church. God is calling us to rise up. We have to rise up. He wants to use us. These are the end days. And God will use us like they did in the book of Acts. They went out and turned the world upside down. We can't just come to church on Sunday and Wednesday. And then live just the rest of the week. Even if you're not doing bad or you're not uh, doing bad. Dude, does everybody at your workplace know you're a Christian? Do they know you're a Christian? God is calling us to stand up. And He's empowered us. I promise you. I wouldn't be able to do what I do today. Coming from being a heroin junkie. This should be dead. I shot up and I shot up and I used dirty needles. I was so terrible. So terrible. I should be dead and God is using me if we would just obey His Word, abide in His Word, expose the sin for what it is, abide in Him. We have to abide in Him. It's all about Christ. It's not the work and the activity. We have to abide in Him. We must have a personal relationship. So the five steps for beating addiction or habits or um, anything you may be struggling with, smoking cigarettes even maybe, Whatever it may be, God's called you to be set free from it. Don't be, we heard at the very beginning, do not be set, put back into the bondage you were set free from. Jesus Christ died to set you free, even from cigarettes. We have to expose the sin. We have to expose the addiction. We must surrender to God. We have to surrender to Christ. We can't live His Word without being surrendered to Him. We have to stay in the Bible. We have to know the Bible. We have to know it. Know that Bible so that when times come where Christians are persecuted in America, we have that Bible so deep inside of us that even if they burn all our Bibles, 
we still have the Word of God. And then we must obey it. Because knowing the Bible means nothing if we don't obey it. And we must examine ourselves and see, are we in the faith? Are we truly who we say we are? Is Jesus Christ glorified by us because He saved us to bring glory to the Father? Everything He does is to bring glory to the Father. So I pray today this Word would stick. I believe there's many people in here that may be struggling, that may have family members that are struggling with addiction. You may be someone in here today that you're not living for Christ. You're not living the way you should. And I pray this would be an encouragement today to you. Live for Christ. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. My brother was from Indiana. My brother saw me as a heathen all my life. Uh, even when I got saved and I went back to Indiana and, and you know, was saved and everything, um, he would still try to hang out with me. He saw me in drugs all, all, ever since I was 12. He's three years younger than me. So since he was nine years old, he saw me getting in drugs. Um, I used to couldn't wait till he was 12 years old, so he would, because that's when I started. I figured he'd start smoking weed with me, my little brother. I, I waited for that until I was 16, still, nothing. And uh, so I had gotten somewhat cleaned up and saved, and I went back to Indiana. And he would sit there and try to watch movies with me in my, grandma's li or my mom's living room. And I was so bad on them pills and heroin that I'd be nodding out, and I'd, I'd wake up, and I'd have to say, hey, we started over, I passed out again three or four times in one movie. And uh, he saw, and I always said, at least one thing I know God did through my addiction, it made him never want to do drugs because I was bad. I was bad, and it had taken over my life. But see, God has set me free, and he can set anyone free. There is hope because, see, now he went and got his master's degree, could be making tons of money somewhere, and I got notified through God. God did this. See, if you surrender your life to Christ... Mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, if you surrender your life to Christ, fully surrender to Christ, and begin praying, your kids will come into the kingdom. I believe it. I truly believe it. And as I surrendered my life to Christ, and began serving the Lord through this ministry, giving my life for it, God began doing works in my family's life. It wasn't me talking. I quit trying to preach to them. Because you drive them away most of the time. Because they've seen what happened in the church and what they're people were like that were in church. But I began praying, and God brought my brother down here from Indiana to come work for us. Starting June 1st, he started working for us as our development director could be making tons of money somewhere. You guys know we don't charge any of these men any money. We don't get support from the government. So we don't have money to pay. I don't take a salary. I live there on property. I'm working pretty much 24 hours a day, middle of the night, seven days a week. I don't get paid. Yet my brother came all the way from Indiana. God drew my brother in all the way from Indiana to come work alongside us in this ministry. And it's been such a blessing. So there's hope. There's hope for you, no matter what it is. I want to pray, if you would all bow, please. I know there's many that may have loved ones that are struggling with addiction. Family members, friends. And I want to pray for you. If you, have, if you yourself or you have a loved one or a friend that's struggling with addiction, will you raise your hand, please? I won't embarrass you. The Lord knows and the Lord will honor it. We've got to go into prayer for him. And then I want to ask you another question. There may be someone in here that's never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And maybe they did say a prayer, but they haven't lived it. They haven't taken that word and read it, indulged in it, and went out to tell the good news. I'm not going to embarrass you. If that's you today, raise your hand saying, I want to live for Christ. I want to serve God with my everything. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Not living the way they should necessarily. Maybe not even in drugs or alcohol. But not living fully surrendered to Christ. Thank you, sir. Lord, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your word today. Father, thank you for everything you do for our lives. Thank you for your blood, Lord. I pray, Lord, if that, if that was you and you raised your hand, um, everybody just repeat this prayer after me. We're going to pray for those in agreement, for those who don't know the Lord as their Savior or haven't been living for Him. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your bloodshed, Jesus Christ. 
I know I haven't been living for you, but I pray, Lord, today that you would make yourself real in my life. I repent of any sin inside of me, Lord. Maybe even any hidden sin that I don't know about. Bring it to light, Father, and forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Put your Holy Spirit inside of me that I can live for you in boldness and go out and be a light in this dark world. In Jesus' name, I want to pray for for those struggling with addictions or friends that are struggling with addictions. Prayer is powerful. The prayer of the righteous man availeth much, saith the Word of God. Lord, we thank You for everything You do, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank You for Your blood that was shed to set us free from our bondages, Lord. We lift our loved ones up, our child, our grandmother, our brother, our sister, our grandson, our granddaughter. We lift them up to You, Lord. We know through Your testimonies today and Your power that You can set them free. We pray now and we intercede for them where they are right at this moment. We pray, Holy Spirit, You will make Yourself known. Intervene in their situation, Lord. We pray if they're struggling with drugs or alcohol or or unlawfulness, Lord, that You would do whatever it takes to arrest them, Lord. If You have to put them in jail, put them in jail, Lord. Keep them from harming themselves and others, Lord. Set them free from the bondages of sin. Set them free from their drug addictions, their alcoholism. whatever Whatever it may be, in the name of Jesus, Father. Thank You, Lord, for everything You do. Thank You for Your power that has set us free. Thank You for Your Word that was brought forth today. Let us walk out here changed. Not walking in the same way we came in, but walking out into a new life. Lord, put Your Word inside of us. Protect us as we go out. Be with all our loved ones. Draw them into Your kingdom through our obedience. In Jesus' name, Amen. Fellowship meets every Sunday morning at the beautiful Lemon Bay Performing Arts Center, located on the campus of Lemon Bay High School at 2201 Placida Road in Inglewood, Florida. Our early worship service begins at 9 a.m. and the main worship service begins at 10.30 a.m. Between these two worship services, we offer gourmet coffee, fresh juices, pastries, and lots of fellowship free of charge in our hospitality center. If you're looking for a church in the Inglewood area or would like to just pay us a visit, we would love to fellowship with you. For more information, give us a call at 941-475-7447 or log on to fellowshipinglewood.com. For Pastor Gary Clark and all of us at Fellowship, God bless you.